Hello, everybody. My name is Alan Gray Eyes. I'm the festival director for the Sakahiwe Festival. I'm joining you from Treaty One Territory, which is the homeland of the Metis, the Anishinaabe, Oji Cree, Cree, Dene, and Dakota peoples. And we have an incredible Inuit uh, community here as well. And I think like land acknowledgments are kind of controversial, but I still like to to use them. Uh, as much as possible just to reinforce the fact that we're still here, we're still vibrant people, and we have incredible futures ahead of us. Um, today we're going to talk about reconciliation. We have two incredible guests with us today. I'm going to ask them to just introduce themselves first, uh, and we'll start with Desiree. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me as part of this conversation. Uh, my name is Desiree Dorian. I am Cree from the Opaskwak Cree Nation. I make my home in Dauphin, Manitoba, and I am a singer-songwriter. Oh, good. Uh, Rai, introduce yourself for us, please. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, my name is Rai uh, Moran. Currently living in uh, the traditional territories of the uh, Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, uh, Lekwungen territories. Uh, my home is actually in Wasanic territories. Uh, pretty well grew up out here on the west side of Canada in uh, Greater Victoria. Uh, roots wise, uh, we're a Metis family from the Red River. I spent the last 10 years, 11 years actually, living in Treaty One territories, homeland of the Metis in Winnipeg, Manitoba, working both for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. And I'm out here at the uh, University of Victoria now, so really look forward to the conversation. I'm a musician as well, uh, trying to dust things off. I got my studio reassembled this week. That's uh, exciting times for me. So uh, looking forward to getting back into that after a very busy decade. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, it's no mistake that we have folks that kind of uh, uh, are in the academic world or the, the legal world, definitely using uh, a lot of business skills. And then we have, and then you're also um, recording artists and musicians and songwriters. And so I think it's an interesting intersection. And uh, that's kind of why I tapped you both on the shoulder to join this conversation today. And a little bit about myself, I'm a member of the Pegasus First Nation. I've grown up in Winnipeg. I always consider Winnipeg our traditional territory, even if it isn't a part of the res reservation. And uh, yeah, so um, I, I also like to acknowledge my mom. Like I think in our family, intergenerational trauma affects us all. And it's still affecting our grandchildren, the grandchildren in my family. And uh, I really feel like I can only excel and do work at this level because my mom takes the lion's share of the, the craziness that happens in our, in our family or the, or the healing that needs to happen in our family. And so I'm not the one answering calls in the middle of the night uh, when bad things happen in our family or bad things happen to our family members. And so, again, I just want to take this opportunity to acknowledge my mom and, and, and the fact that I really couldn't be at this level doing the things that I do if it wasn't for her. Um, but yeah, I want to, let's just jump into the conversation and we're going to talk about reconciliation and also reference some materials and inspiration that Indigenous and non-Indigenous artists can, can, can access and use to activate their ideas. But I want to ask Rai for a bit more about like your work with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Can you tell us what you did there and, and kind of... Um, the, the stories that you're carrying and the lessons that you've, that you've learned along the way. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, my, my start with the commission actually started even before the Murray Sinclair Wilton Little Child Murray Wilson Commission. Uh, there was a brief early iteration of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that had a bit of a false start. And, but at that point, I had already recognized um, just how incredibly important the work was going to be and how vital the work was going to be for this process of national healing. And basically at that point, I was still doing a lot of recording and still uh, actually very active in a lot of different oral history work, leveraging some of the skills that I had developed actually through music and just said, look, if you need any help at all, I'm here to help uh, because this is so vitally important. Once the commission was reestablished, I ended up um, having conversations with the commissioners again and, and ultimately ended up interviewing for the role and starting off as the director of statement gathering and the National Research Center at that point. And very quickly having to build out the system that would uh, enable the oral history, which is so incredibly important for this country, uh, to be recorded for survivors to share their experiences and uh, for the truth to be protected and preserved for all time. Um, added to that, 
in my role was all of the document collection work as well. So I was responsible for going out and literally chasing down the documents in uh, church and government archives. And we're talking about millions of pages uh, in all. I'm sure as you know, those listening have tuned into the into the news over the past summer, the question of where are the records and who produced and who didn't produce has been very active. That was very much part of my work. So we were in and out of court continuously. We were on the road, we were gathering statements, we were holding national events. It, um, it was an incredible life-changing experience. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I heard incredible, um, incredible statements of strength, of resilience, of determination, of never again, of this must stop. And I also heard absolutely heartbreaking accounts of what was done to children in those residential schools. And um, it, um, uh, what happened in those schools is, um, it's almost beyond words. Uh, well, it is beyond words, it's, yeah. Yeah, and uh, it seems like most recently we've, uh, the, the unmarked graves, the burial sites have come to light. But there is an entire, there's multiple sections in these reports that document those. Is, is that correct? Absolutely. Uh, the question of missing children was present right at the very outset of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's work. And in fact, we, we took that on very early as a special project. Uh, we did ask survivors um, whether or not they were aware of or knew of any children that never returned home from the school. Um, in our statement gathering processes. More um, fundamental almost to that though, is if you ever do happen to have the opportunity to look at some of the footage from the TRC's events, you'll see that in all of our public gatherings, there was always two empty chairs placed on stage in a, in a place of honor uh, at everything that we did. And those empty chairs were meant to not only symbolize, but welcome in the children that never returned home from the schools. Uh, one for the, for the male students, one for the female students. We recognized in doing our work that quite honestly, it wasn't just a, this wasn't a paper exercise. This was also happening on a spiritual level as well. So ceremonies and acknowledgement of those missing children was continuous and present throughout everything that we did. And that continues to this day at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. Uh, it's something that is forever in my heart as well. And I don't think that there's a day, honestly, that goes by in my life that I don't think about those children and try to do what I can to bring honor to them and say that you're loved and that you're not forgotten. Oh, that's powerful. And Desiree, I just wanted to, to get maybe some of your story and how um, residential schools have uh, affected your family. Yeah, um, my grandmother is a residential school survivor and my dad is a day school survivor. Uh, my grandmother went to residential school for the bulk of her childhood, um, which in effect really disrupted her ability to parent, um, which in turn made my dad's ability to parent uh, challenging at times. And you know, now as, as an adult, and I'm speaking about myself as an adult, um, when I reflect back on my relationship with my, my father and my grandmother, I mean, I, I definitely have a lot more empathy because I, I understand, um, you know, at least to some extent, what it, what it was that they endured. Um, but, you know, that, that still uh, hasn't had or hasn't come without its own um, layers of complexity. And, you know, trying to navigate that um, as a child uh, was was difficult for sure. Um, you know, it, it's it's gotten easier as an adult the more that I learn about uh, residential schools and specifically, um, you know, the schools the school that my grandmother went to. Um, so, yeah, and I mean, I'm a mom now, and so trying to navigate parenthood, motherhood, um, making sure you know, being hyper aware of not repeating the patterns that I grew up with and that the patterns that I experienced as a child and, and sometimes being hyper-focused about that, you know, making sure that I'm sheltering my kids from some of the stuff that, that I witnessed as a, as a child and that I experienced as a child. Yeah, definitely. I, I feel like the residential school system and all the policies that w went into creating them was, was really about the destruction of our families. And like mm -hmm. you said, Desiree, that 
the destruction of parenting skills. And um, we had entire generations that were raised without parents. I remember uh, mo most recently I was on a call with SoCan and I explained to them like we had, we had, we had our own, like every nation, every, every community, every family had their own lullabies in their language. And those were erased for the most part. Can you imagine having like your whole family not knowing lullabies to sing to your, to the babies and, and being raised with love and, and culture and language? I mean, it's, it's, it's such an incredible, an incredible endeavor. Just, yeah. Just and I think even just an inability to connect, you know, like, uh, intimacy isn't something that just exists in romantic relationships. There's intimacy between mothers and, and their babies and, and fathers and their kids. And, and when you, when you are uh, raised in a way that completely lacks, is lacking of all affection and love, you know, I think you come out of that being somewhat of a shell and, and vacant of, uh, of emotion or, or ability to um, show emotion and affection and love and um, an inability really to relate to some of those um, emotions that go really to the crux of what it means to be human and what it means to be definitely a parent. So, yeah, I think it's pretty clear that we, we lost a lot. And um, I wanted to kind of ask both of you and maybe Rai, you can jump in and like what, what does reconciliation mean to you? Like, is this, I remember Rob, Bob Canoe once saying that reconciliation is not a second opportunity or a second chance at assimilation. And um, I'm like, what does it, what, what does reconciliation mean to you, Rye? Well, I, I, I've spent a lot of time <laughs> thinking about this question. <laughs> it's kind of a daily sort of rumination or meditation, I guess. Um, I do keep coming back to the definition that was put forward in the TRC's reports and layering into that and understanding where that came from, I think. Um, because the, what's put forward in the TRC's report actually started long before the TRC. The TRC didn't develop it itself. Um, what the TRC said was that it's the establishment and maintenance of mutually respectful relationships. I have to admit, when I first read that, I thought, oh, this is like rather short and it's not that toothy in a way. Um, the more time I've spent with that though, and it's certainly the more time I've spent with knowledge keepers and elders out there, the more I realized the depth of that and how much it goes all the way right back to the land actually. Because when we like functionally, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, which also was intended at resetting the relationship between Canada and indigenous peoples, um, said very, very similar words around what reconciliation is and what it remains. When I think about establishing and maintaining, the establishing part says that we are not in that respectful relationship yet. So we're in the building time. The process of this is very, very important. That's, that's very, very present focused. It's verb based and it's now. So how we show up, what we bring into the room, what we bring in in terms of our own in, interior knowledge or our self-awareness of what we're carrying around or what we're not carrying around um, is present. The maintenance means that this is really, really hard work too. It's not like we just get to reconcile with a checklist. It's hard work and it's ongoing. And then when I think about it more, I think about it, it's establishing and maintaining respectful relationship with our pasts. So the reconciliation between the existence of the Canadian state and the presence of colonial laws on top of multiple longstanding, very um, like highly sophisticated indigenous nations, the history of colonization, um, establishing respectful relationships with our present so making sure that we're listening to people who need to be listened to and not silencing and not displacing and not seeing again, like rooms filled with, you know, uh, uh, you know, leaders that are not reflective of how society is actually comprised today, right? Not continuing to erode indigenous rights. Um, Alan, you talked about futures and dreams, establishing respectful relationship with our futures. Indigenous dreams are important. Indigenous dreams of what Canada could and should look like in the future need to be treated with a great amount of care and need to be shown respect, especially in the context of Indigenous rights. 
And then lastly, I mean, and it's kind of a long answer, but it's establishing respectful relationships with the land itself. You know, the, there was some that said the TRC didn't go far enough on land. And I think it's in that definition because we are not living in a respectful relationship with the land. And what do we have to change? And that puts kind of everything on the table uh, in terms of how we're choosing to live and how we're choosing to live with our original mother, um, how we're choosing to configure our societies and, and operate either sustainably or not sustainably. That's where, to me, reconciliation is actually very, very deep. It's very, very powerful. And it's, you know, I can, I'm certain that I'm going to spend the rest of my lifetime reflecting on that one sentence, actually. Yeah. And, and for me, I, I, I want to just add, like, I've kind of simplified it even more. For me, in, in my work, when I look at reconciliation, I really haven't read any definitions and I wasn't, uh, I didn't have the same experience as you, Rai, which is mm -hmm. uh, quite powerful. But um, in my work in the arts, I just think like reconciliation means how do I make Canada a safer place for Indigenous people? And how do I do that through the arts? And uh, I wanted to give Desiree a chance to jump in here. Like what, I think we've all been exposed to this idea of reconciliation. And what does that mean for you, Desiree? It means a whole bunch of things. I mean, I think Rise, right, that it's, there's no short answer uh, to what that means. I mean, for me, I think it means representation of Indigenous people in all aspects of society, you know, in media, in, um, in professions, whatever professions, uh, they're, you know, every aspect of society representation. I want my daughters to be able to see themselves um, in, in every facet of society that, that, that they encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. But I also think that it is um, a national changing of hearts and of minds um, I think that it's ending litigation against Indigenous mm -hmm. groups and um, communities and nations across the country. It's honoring the treaties. Um, I think the first thing that I would do if I, you know, had control over the province of Manitoba would be to overhaul the CFS system. Yeah. Um, I mean, that that is tangibly probably one of the biggest um most impactful uh, things that could be done immediately. And, you know, the federal government recently uh, set those wheels in motion, but unfortunately they didn't, um, they didn't really consult with the provinces when they enacted uh, Bill C-92, which is an act respecting First Nations um, Inuit, Métis children and families. And um, really what that means is that the province of Manitoba hasn't been cooperating uh, to a large extent with respect to overhauling the CFS system. But we like Manitoba has one of the highest uh, apprehension rates in North America. Mm -hmm. um, I believe we're now over 11,500 kids in care and that needs to stop. We need to stop separating indigenous kids from their parents and families. Yeah, so, so, the, so yeah, truly the legacy of residential schools is ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, it's just taken the form of uh, child and family services and is child and family services referred to in the, under the same title in every province is is that the, what it's called in in Ontario Quebec uh, I'm just wondering for our, our listeners from across the country no children's aid it's referred to as well children's sure. aid societies yeah so it's mostly dealing with the apprehension of children yeah under the under the banner of safety is is that correct or uh, yes, yeah, safety, uh, need of protection, and then the secondary consideration is best interests. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And definitely, the thing that bothers me with that whole system is that those those uh, foster families or those caregivers are paid a lot more than than our our indigenous families are to take care of our own children. And so I think it's it is a system that needs a complete overhaul, and it's uh, definitely carrying on the spirit of an, and intent of. Uh, of residential schools, it, it seems like. Um, well, that's where people like Cindy Blackstock, I mean, they're so important, uh, they're such important voices to listen to and, and talk again about the present day. I mean, she says that, you know, we're failing our kids today. Like this isn't historic. This isn't like black and white photos. This is now, right? Yeah. And, and that's where there, you know, there is urgency to all of this because 
So we're still living in a time where we're setting ourselves up for future class action lawsuits or future settlements because our systems are still so inherently discriminatory and still structurally violent against Indigenous peoples that, you know, it's, we're, and that's, that, the time for change was, you know, not just yesterday, it was, it was decades ago. So that's where there is ever increasing urgency. Yeah, and I think like uh, the the apprehension rates and the birth alerts are specifically re referenced in the calls to action. Is that correct? Hey, yeah, if you actually look at the calls to action, it actually starts with child welfare um, because um, this is about children. The, this is all about what is done, was one uh, was done, and will continue to be done to children for a period of time until we get our act together as a society. You know, children's rights children's rights to be with their families, with their cultures, with their languages, um, with their identities, um, right to safety, but right to also heal uh, through and for families to heal through all of this, you know, ugliness that has happened in this, this country is central in all of this work. And that's precisely why those calls to action around child welfare were, were centered so uh, visibly by the TRC. Yeah. This is about children. Even, even more basic than, uh, you know, a right to be safe, but I think of just the right to love, you know, yeah. and, and when I, when I picture in the work that I do um, in my day job, um, when I envision a child being forcibly removed from their home, I visualize where and when is that child going to be loved again? And when are they going to feel that love again? Um, because it's, it's not likely going to be in the foster home that they're staying in. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and with this in mind, I, with all of these incredible stories and situations and the current, the current reality in mind, what role can the arts play in the reconciliation process? Um, do either of you uh, want to jump on that one? I, I can start. I Go ahead, yeah. Well, yeah. I just really let me just preface it with the um and and i've i've uh, asked Brad this before uh, like how come the arts is only referenced in in call to action 83 and i know he's got a great response to that but maybe yeah desiree what what role do the arts have to play within this reconciliation process well i can only really speak to i think my experience um being an independent artist in the country music genre for uh, over a decade the country music genre is a tough genre to be an, ind an, ind an indigenous artist <laughs> because it's very, um, it's known to be very conservative and very white. And what I have tried to do, um, and I'll just give you an example, for instance, the title track of my last album is called Break the Chain. And I've sang that song right across the country and in certain parts of the United States. And every time I, I talk about that song, I talk about my grandmother's experience in residential school and my dad's experience in day school. And there have been times where I've been scared, to be honest, to, to share that story in, in the country music circles because I don't know how it's going to be received. But what I do know is that as an artist and as a mom, I have to be honest. And I have to be honest about who I am. And part of that is telling that story. And what I hope to do to achieve and accomplish when I do that is to change one mind, change one heart, and, and find something or, or, or have something um, in me that is relatable to uh, someone in the audience, you know, so that they can they can grow uh, their empathy uh, for the Indigenous experience in Canada. And if I can do that, if I can change one one mind at every show, then that's 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 a I'm I'll, I'll, I'll settle for that. Yeah, they're a great answer. And Rive, um, for you, like what I, I'm going to say, what. What can music do um, to help the reconciliation process? Not just the arts, specifically music. Yeah. So, I mean, music is obviously very dear to my heart. Um, and some, I think of music in lots of different ways, but I think of it being like 
maybe the language of emotion. So just to try to define it in a way. And one of the things if you're creating is that you've got an opportunity to convey emotions, uh, how, how, how you're experiencing them too, and, and to create some vulnerability and some authenticity around that. Um, I have friends that are non-Indigenous that have, you know, grappled with their own emotions around confronting this history of genocide in their music. And, and it's been a very important, not only artistic practice for them, but also a process of self-development and self-awareness and learning as they sort of try to tang uh, like untangle some of the conflicting histories or messages that they've got inside of them. And that's the process that Canadians have to go through. You know, we have to, but like all this like stuff around decolonizing means undoing things, right? And undoing, decolonizing ourselves. Um, there, so that's, I think, you know, part of the creative process, you can use the process itself to, to work on yourself, I think, and, and to find some places. Um, there's always, opportunities for collaborations and for work um, with others um, and to seek out um, people to work with, um, obviously in a non-appropriative kind of way. Um, if you're a festival programmer or anything like that, you've also got a lot of ability to choose Indigenous in all sorts of different kinds of ways. So, you know, you can print your flyers from an Indigenous company or you can um, select Indigenous artists to perform, or you can, you know, find a transportation company perhaps in your local area that does, I don't know, there's all sorts of Indigenous businesses out there. So that's, you know, if you're starting to move into the more the, the, the management side of, of um, the arts industry. But in general, uh, the arts are exceptionally important for reconciliation because they can convey these emotions that need to be conveyed. And they can bring our hearts into this conversation and, and help us feel these feelings that ultimately need to be unlocked within us. And I mean, elders across the country, I mean, they always talk about the journey from the head to the heart, but this is where a lot of good music comes from. And this is also where reconciliation comes from and empathy and love and kindness and all that sort of stuff. And that's, this is the place that we have to be speaking from and listening from and walking from, I think, as, as we try to do all of this that needs to be done. And, and for me, so as someone in the arts and in music, I really wanted more specifics in the calls to action. I know I've told Rai this a number of times. I, I wanted those um, direct actions that Canada Council could take, direct actions that Canadian Heritage should take. And I wanted it to be um, addressing the, the lack of equity in the funding system, specifically in music. Like as, a, as someone who runs a small festival, like we are at a... At a, at, a, at a big disadvantage to the folk festivals and larger festivals across the country because we started later. And oftentimes those bigger, our Canadian counterparts started um, while residential schools were still operating in Canada. And so for me, I didn't inherit um, an audience. I didn't inherit um, incredible board members or operating grants. And uh, that disadvantage, that late starting point for us means that we can't make the same promises to corporate spon sponsors. We can't make the same promises to, um, to artists that our Canadian counterparts can. And so that, that, that makes it hard, hard for us to grow if we can't get the same level of, of private investment. That makes it hard for Indigenous artists across the country to, to launch careers because they don't have those same development opportunities as their Canadian counterparts do. And so again, I, I really wanted more in the calls to action that would help us realize, uh, so, so, like correct some of those historic injustices within the arts. And I think that's what's, for me, that's what's missing. I feel like we've been left to um, uh, define our inequities, the injustices. We've been left to, to do that work on our own. And so again, Rai, I know that you guys did some incredible work, but I do wish that the arts were referenced specifically with more direct actions built in. And I think maybe that's our role in the music community is to you know, define what those calls to actions should be. And uh, because I, like Desiree and like yourself, I see the power within every stage. Every stage gives us an opportunity to reach hundreds, if not thousands, of Canadians. You know, we're we're performing in front of police officers and judges and and doctors and 
and other lawyers and accountants, you know, people that have um, influence and not only influence, but um, direct uh, responsibilities to provide service and supports to us. And I think we've seen Joyce Etchewan, I, I, can, I can never pronounce her name, but her, her mistreatments in, in Montreal's uh, or Quebec hospitals led to her death. And we've seen examples of these across the country. And so again, I believe that's our power is to reach these people in their hearts, like you said, and uh, show them that we're just as like indigenous people are just as special and unique as their loved ones. So like I said, I wish we had more support, but I think it just means we have more work ahead of us. And I think you're right though, Alan. Like, I mean, I think that's one of the cautions that I would offer anybody listening to the to this discussion um, on is, is, you know, the TRC's calls to action are one part of a bigger chunk of um, frameworks that are intended to push us towards uh, both human rights, uh, indigenous rights, which are human rights and uh, healing. So taken on their own, the 94 calls to action, yes, only have one call to action on, the, um, on, on music specifically. But when we look at the principles of reconciliation, it says a couple of things. One, the revitalization of indigenous cultures is everybody's business. And that is a fundamental principle of reconciliation and everybody is implicated in that. Everybody has a role to play in uh, restoring what must be return, uh, restored, repairing what must be repaired and returning what must be returned. So indigenous people have inherent rightful place that is, has to be recognized. Corresponding to that too, like at the state level or at Canada Council level or anything like that, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples very clearly says that Indigenous peoples have a right to be Indigenous and have a right to transmit their cultures to future generations, have a right to their languages, identities, and that states have a responsibility to create the protections necessary through funding, through the other mechanisms like that, to allow those or to enable uh, those intergenerational transmissions of knowledge to occur. So this, like when you create space for an indigenous person on a stage, that's not an act of benevolence. That is recognizing that that is a fundamental human right of indigenous peoples to be indigenous in their own country, in their own land. So this is not like all, um, like we have to keep it really grounded in some of these really fundamental like human rights based principles. Um, where we recognize each and every day that we walk here that this is indigenous land. There's no question about that. So indigenous cultures have to be invested in, have to be protected and have to be seen as part of that robust overall cultural framework um, that you know Canada invests frankly heavily in. I think the challenge in a lot of cases for people who are willing to support that kind of effort and that movement or those um, realities is that they're also confronted with the idea of the BIPOC acronym and um, Indigenous people being included in, in that BIPOC acronym. And why it seems to me like Indigenous people shouldn't be um, alongside Black and other people of color. Um, does that make sense to you? Is, is that what Section 35 is all about? Is that we are unique and different and you know, we have um, rights that go beyond um, uh, the mistreatment in the media or stereotypes and racism. Yeah, I don't know. Desiree, do you have any particular thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, you're right, Alan, in the sense that Indigenous rights are constitutionally protected. Um, but even deeper than that, like, looking at the treaties. I mean, there's, there's the, the, the contractual agreements that have been made across the country between um, non-Indigenous people and Indigenous people. And so, um, you know, I, I think that, I, I think that that's a really good question. That's a big question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I think we've seen um, the, the launch or the development of deaf, diversity and equity um, and inclusion uh, groups in, in almost every funding agency across the country and definitely in different festivals and organizations. And, and again, it seems to me like our inherent rights and our treaties um, mean that we have a unique place that should be um, protected and, and empowered 
above and beyond what our, our black and brown relatives um, experience in this land. Yeah, I think, um, and that's, I think, as we're confronting these really enmeshed and tangled histories of racism and oppression, you know, we're finding that there's both convergences and divergences, right? So when we think about, you know, equity, diversity, inclusion initiatives, I also append onto that truth, reconciliation, and respect. And to me, it, it gets, it's all into this same overall broad framework of protection and promotion of human rights, human dignity, fundamental principles of justice, equality, fairness, healing, and peacemaking, right? Like that's the big overall overarching thing. The, where it is absolutely appropriate to be looking at the commonalities is when we look at the broad histories of racism and oppression and the the presence of that still in society. Like we, we're, we have to be united in combating racism and oppression. And this, is, this applies across many, many different you know, facets. I mean, this is like uh, people of color, it's women, it's trans, it's indigenous. Like there's a whole bunch of awfulness in the, in, in the world still that we have to stop. In that though, we also have to not only see the difference, but understand the difference and embrace the difference too. And I think that's what you're talking about, um, Alan, is that it's not good to get all lumped into the same basket because we are different. We have different histories. We have different realities. It's different to be Métis than it is to be First Nations. And it's different to be First Nations from the coast, from the West Coast than it is to the East Coast. That di diversity is not a problem. It's actually awesome and it's wonderful. And that's the one thing when I think about you know, a Canada in the future is, is I sure hope that we have embraced diversity much, 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 much more than we have, certainly with Indigenous um, presence fully enmeshed at the center of that, because these are the lands that we're on. But we have to get a, well away from the idea that this is a white country, because it really, frankly, never has been a white country. It's just been white people that have been running it and playing make-believe that it is a white country. So, I don't know. Those are some of my thoughts, at least on that. Yeah, no, definitely. And I, I just got to say that I always come into these panel discussions with more questions than answers. And I think like, I'm, I always like, I'm not an artist, so I don't have to go on stage all the time. And I have the benefit of just continually learning and not having to define myself. <laughs> and earlier, Rai, you mentioned like verbs. And I, I love the idea of verbs being more important than nouns. And I know in Anishinaabe Moen, I remember seeing Susan Blight talk about you know, Anishinaabe Moen is mostly verbs, which means, you know what, we don't label people and we, we always give them the ability to change because we're describing them in, in their actions. And so I, I think that that's a, a worldview that at the heart of the language, and it just, uh, I'm hoping that everyone will, will, will listen to us talking today and understand that we're still learning as well. And so for me, again, I don't have any answers for the the BIPOC acronym, I, I, I like like yourselves, I think we're all in this to, to make Canada a safer place for everyone. Um, and uh, for me, I'm like immediately concerned about my children and my family. And so again, that's why my focus is on make it safer for Indigenous people. But Rai, you also mentioned diversity and, and the idea that Indigenous people across the country are, are extremely different. And not only differences between nations, but also families and and some some nations have clans and there's difference and different roles and responsibilities within those. And I, I learned through um, Tanahasi Coates between the world and me, the idea that, you know, the more diverse we are, um, the safer we are. Um, that idea that, you know, if people see us as individuals and not representative of of all the stereotypes they've learned or been exposed to in the past. And so again, for me, reconciliation is about safety. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to like give our listeners an idea of like what they can do. And, and we're not only reaching indigenous folks today, I think we're reaching non-indigenous artists and, and folks within the music industry. And I wanted to see if there's any examples of, you know, um, call to action 83 coming to life. 
that being the comm commemoration of residential schools and that experience and, and also collaboration between Indigenous and non-Indigenous artists is, can you, the two of you, do you know of any examples of this call to action kind of being realized? Well, one of the ones that it just the one of the immediate ones, and it's not art. Uh, it's not. It's not art. It's absolutely art. It's not music. <laughs> uh, I would shudder to say that, but um, <laughs> was actually uh, one of the commemoration initiatives that was funded by the TRC, and it's this is um, a multidisciplinary art project called the Witness Blanket, and it's very very important, I think, for a whole number of reasons. So one. Uh, created by a First Nations artist here, a Kwakwakiwak and Coast Salish artist by the name of Carrie Newman um, from sort of these territories out here. But in his work, he went around and collected one physical item from every residential school in the country and then assembled this into a massive piece of monumental art on seven different cedar panels. Um, and along the way, recorded everything um, and not only recorded oral history interviews with residential school survivors, but um, interviews with community members, intergenerational survivors, and has now channeled that into an absolutely exceptional, exceptional and permanent ongoing educational gift to this country. So the artifact itself, or the, the art piece, sits at the Canadian Museum of History. The videos live online. They're in classrooms, they've been turned into a book format. And it's a really great example of taking, you know, one initiative and keeping it going and keeping it alive. And what they've done in that, and, and I've never actually talked about this like um, in, in this type of format before, but what they did with the witness blanket when they signed the legal agreement with the Canadian Museum of History is, is that they recognized that the witness blanket was alive itself. It itself had agency because it reflected this sort of collective will and collective dream of people across the country. So what that has done is, is taken the people that are responsible for the creation of this and put them in service of that piece of art and have surrounded that thing, not with a sense of control or ownership over it, but a sense of doing what is right by that that piece of art and i th i think there's opportunities like that to move into service um, into service of art initiatives and projects that educate the public very very important because we're still very much in this time of truth telling um, that create something really meaningful and transformative for people um, contribute meaningfully to the to the creation of new understanding and um and we see ourselves, yeah, as, as kind of like humble servants to the to the creative process in this regard and allow what needs to come out to come out um, with good thoughts and good minds. Yeah, and Desiree, did you get a chance to see Kent Monkman's um, exhibit when it was at the Winnipeg Art Gallery? No, I didn't. Oh, it was incredibly powerful. Yeah, and he has a number of paintings that kind of uh, tell the story of apprehension and uh, yeah, and I think like that's an incredible piece of art that'll be able to, you know, provoke thought and, 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 and encourage people to dig deeper in the future. And, and uh, Desiree, have you, have you seen any examples of like collaborative projects in music that maybe touch on reconciliation or bring to light some of the experiences um, in re residential schools? I can't think of collaborative projects off the top of my head, um, but just to go back to uh, your comment about Kent Monkman's uh, exhibit at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. I mean, I think I'm a rural artist, and so for me to go to Winnipeg is a seven hour return trip. So, you know, the way that rural folks access art is a lot different than folks who are living in the city. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think for me, uh, the two best pieces that have resonated with me uh, on the topic of reconciliation um, is, first of all, the book uh, that Wab Canoe wrote uh, called The Reason You Walk. Um, that was super relatable for me because you know, it talked about a, a family history that is that was similar to, to mine in the sense that, you know, there was a complex relationship between uh, him and his father, but then one of forgiveness. And I, for me, 
you know, reconciliation is more than just reconciling the non-Indigenous community with the Indigenous community. It's reconcil reconciling um, our history within ourselves, you know, and embracing forgiveness and, and uh, leaning into forgiveness and, and finding empathy for our ancestors and our, and our families. And so that book um, really uh, resonated with me. The other piece that um, what is so powerful, and I cry almost every single time I hear it, is uh, Leonard Sumner's um, mm. I Know Your Story. And I, I get chills every single time I hear that piece. And so, you know, those would be the two pieces um, of, of work that I would really recommend people uh, dig into. Um, I just, those are, are just powerful, powerful pieces of art. Yeah. No, go ahead, Ray. Well, it's just sort of made me think too, a couple of other ones that, and, and this is me putting my sort of love for archives and and memory i guess on uh, out there but you know the the chills piece so there's a couple that really jump out of my mind um one is i think it's uh elizabeth isaac's uh wolves don't live by the rules which is a cover mm -hmm. of a old is it uh, uh willie thrasher there we go thank you i didn't want to get the name wrong there what i love so much about the video and if you haven't seen the video is you know the folks tuning in watch the video because i just love that video because it's it's her watching old archival like, sort of home movies and probably national film board reels and stuff. And I just love, I love the light on the face. I love the, the sense of looking back and trying to put the pieces together. And then I love the theme too, like wolves don't live by the rules. It's just so awesome. And it's such a powerful statement of rights, right? Um, the other piece that I love too is, is again, it's an archival thing, but it's, uh, you know, Jeremy Dutcher's work going back and, and pulling out the, his grandfather's recordings and what, you know, it, there's, we've talked about so many things in this conversation, but, you know, there's a question about what are we investing in today to allow, you know, the Jeremy Dutcher's of two generations from now to come back to this time and listen to the words that were spoken now or the words that were already spoken in the past. Alan, you started off talking about we've lost a lot. Correspondingly, we have to invest in the preservation now so that, you know, artists of the future can come back and not only like work with the language and work with the, the, the stories and the knowledge, but have the land itself to work with, right? And be able to find those places and, and I think between those things, I think that's what I see Elizabeth, at least I haven't talked to her about it, but, you know, see what she's encountering in that, in that, in that, that song, right? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and for our non-Indigenous relatives, I think it's, uh, I recently had a good conversation with Dallas uh, Smith. Uh, he's a country singer, and uh, I just floated the idea, like, if he was to you know, in his music video, Timeless, it tells the story of uh, a timeless love between a, uh, a Canadian husband and wife. And that was like, there's subtlety. But I think discovery is one of the most powerful tools we have in, in music. And if he was to like recast that and put an Indigenous husband and wife in that story, in that music video, I mean, that just, again, goes to, to challenging stereotypes and and, and re, reintroducing the humanity of Indigenous people to show that we just are, we have the ability to love and care just as much as, you know, your relatives and your loved ones do. And so I think like, for, I think, yeah, music, we're so fortunate. We have an abundance of tools to connect with audiences. And so we have music videos, we have live performances. I, I believe like your banter on stage is another tool that you can use. Mm -hmm. Educating yourself, reading as much as you can and, and, and tuning into conversations like this where you're gonna find additional resources I think is extremely important. I think the email lists that artists put out is another important tool. If you were to list like a number of resources like books, films, um, indigenous uh, clothing companies, um, jewelry companies. I think all of those, I remember, Ra, you said like reconciliation is also about economic participation. Mm -hmm. And so again, shining your spotlight on Indigenous creators and Indigenous makers and Indigenous businesses across the country, I think is, is another thing that we can do or our non-Indigenous relatives can do. NCIFM, you know, every weekend, you know, top Indigenous music countdown. I mean, there's incredible artists on there. And, you know, artists that most 
you know, Canadians aren't even paying attention to it. We have had so many incredible artists inside of the community and so many still to come. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's, I think that's one of the things too, is, is like paying attention, like paying attention to what's out there. That's one of the things, the big themes with residential schools is that, you know, the stuff is right there. It's just people haven't been paying attention. They haven't been opting in and haven't been, you know, lifting these histories up and, you know. Yeah. And being now. okay to make space for Indigenous people, especially Indigenous artists. I mean, uh, Jason Isbell is American. He's an Americana American artist. <laughs> and uh, he's got eight nights at the Ryman Auditorium, which is, of course, one of Nashville's biggest stages. And he has mm -hmm. a woman opening every night for him which is almost unheard of. And uh, I think three or four of those nights, um, the, the woman is black, which is again, using the platform that he has and the audience that he has to create space for w women, number one in country music and, and black women. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that, you know, if more artists and, and people in our country took a page out of that book, we would be a heck of a lot further ahead. Yeah, and I started with the land acknowledgements and I don't think anyone needs to get that that detailed every time they take the stage. But I think like, where I remember when I was advancing shows for DJ Shab, I would also do do the research. And so he could just like get on the mic and say, shout out to the uh, Shushwap Nation or the Lillooet Nation, wherever he was playing, just doing a shout out from the stage and just <laughs> letting the audience know that we're still active, we're still like innovative people making contributions to society. And we're not just like what Disney films would have you believe or, or, or professional sports team logos have you believe, you know? Right. And so I think like those, those, those little things that for me at least go a long way. Mm -hmm. And um, I also wanted to give our relatives a chance to like um, discover some of the things that you guys reference when you're on your path to learning and healing. Like, Desiree, are there any books that you might want to recommend people reading about the experience with the residential schools or or the systemic barriers within the Canadian systems? Well, I mean, I think the first thing to read is the are the calls calls to action. Um, I think that that if you haven't read the the calls to action yet, then you should probably start there. Um, but you know, I think even more basic than than reading materials, learn whose land are you on. You know, just knowing, situate yourself. Where are you? Um, read the treaties if you're on if you're on treaty land. And uh, you know, I like. Uh, I already mentioned uh, Wob's book, "The Reason You Walk," but um, you know, uh, the the name of the book is is escaping me right now. Uh, Gordet, the Secret Path, um, mm -hmm. I think, is is a, an incredible uh, read, um, and it's and it's easy. It's an easy read. It's very accessible. So I would start there. Um, and, and if you're someone who doesn't want to devote a whole bunch of time and, and maybe you're more of a, a listener, then, then go to music because there's a lot of powerful stories being told in three minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any music specifically? Start with Leonard Sumner's I Know Your Story. Perfect. And Rye, I wanted to ask you about the resources available at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. Is there an archive that, there that people can can reference and 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 use to like maybe in visual packages for performances? Is there any materials like that available? Yeah, so I think broadly speaking, I mean, there's a lot of sources to be inspired by and from, and just even to educate yourself on. So. Um, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation carries the statements and the documents that were collected by the TRC, and it's and it's a large, very large collection of material. Um, there are materials that you can certainly watch and work with uh, there. Um, you know, if you're looking at actually licensing it and all that sort of thing and incorporating it into a song, there's some sometimes some some use rights and some ethical considerations around using that work because obviously survivors really place a lot of trust in the commission in, in sharing their experiences uh, with the with the TRC. But at the very least, uh, I mean, there's there are thousands of residential school statements on there. Um, they're not easy to watch. Um, they're, they're not easy to watch. It's, it's hard to watch them. 
Um, but if you, for example, live in Ontario, uh, you can watch hearings that happened in, in Ontario. If you live in BC, there's the hearings from BC. If you're in the North, you can look at some of the hearings from there and see what people in your own community were saying. Beyond that, uh, another source that if you want to hear firsthand from people, what people were saying around these broad questions of justice, Library and Archives Canada now has all of the videos and the transcripts from the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples hearings across the country. Now, this was happening in the early 1990s. Um, you can just Google Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, Library and Archives Canada. It'll take you to a little site. They've got the research reports. They've got the transcripts. Spend some time reading the transcripts, you know, like just, just you know, give yourself a little bit of time uh, to work with it. And one thing that if you are interested in it too is, is, you know, maybe challenge yourself to read the opening passage of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples Report. And there's this Mohawk prayer that's um, said at the beginning, and it's a bit of a spoiler, but it basically says very beautifully, Thank you for coming and we're so glad you're here. We're so glad that you're undertaking this learning journey now. And even if you haven't started already, it's never too late to start. And it's never too late to dig in and to learn more. And there's a lot of people actually not only asking you to do this, but just encouraging you to do it and hoping that you're gonna do this as a non-Indigenous person um, to, to heed the call to better inform yourself. National Film Board of Canada is got, there's so many good films. Mm -hmm. Alanis Obamsawin, yeah. so many good films. Imaginative, so many good films. You know, um, NCIFM for music every week. Awesome Indigenous artists. Your festival, any book, Alan. Any you know, book recommendations? Well, I happen to work in a library. So as a matter of fact, <laughs> yeah, I mean, th there are so many great books. Um, so depending on whether or not you like fiction or nonfiction, um, if you go to... Uh, the University of Victoria Libraries. Um, you can even Google the Honoring the Missing Children Library Guide. And it's just got a long list of resources um, that are there for you if you're interested in learning more about uh, the, the disappearance of, of the children and, and the reclaiming of those children. Um, many, many libraries actually right now, uh, Victoria Public Library, all the big libraries right now have great lists uh, of recommended reads. Like there's so many great reads. Um, in terms of authors to look out for, boy, it's hard to know where to start, but um, I would just generally say that there's a whole body of work now written by residential school survivors that you can read. So Edmund Matatawaban and Bev Sellers and just others. Uh, there are incredible poets um, just here at the University of Manitoba or University of Victoria campus, uh, Greg Schofield has been writing beautifully for years and is writing just beautiful work right now too, even on reconciliation, a host of other topics. Um, there's exceptional nonfiction writers too. And if you ever want to dig deep um, really on any subject from indigenous governance to indigenous law to what needs to change in social work. Um, so if, if yeah, there's a thought of two more. Okay. Yeah. Um, Indian Horse by Richard Wagamese is one of my favorites. And um, oh, it just escaped me. Good grief. There, I can't there, think there, of it now. There's another yeah. book that I think both of us have, have read, Desiree, that's uh, Accounting for Genocide. I thought that was really yeah. great. Yeah, I have that here. I can pop off screen and, and uh, tell you exactly who that author is. That was a that was a really, it was a hard read. Um, it wasn't an easy read, but it was a really good one. Um, Half Breed is another one that's, you know, for people that are looking for an easy read. Um, yeah. Not so much about, about residential school, but, a, a, you know, definitely reconciliation focused, I would say. Yeah. While Bryce is writing, Marrow Thieves is really great right now, too. That's like yeah. a super excellent, um, um, uh, again, a piece of fiction. I, I mean, the list kind of goes on right now um, and I think that's one of the great gifts that we got right now as a country is, is that we've got a lot of really talented people um, in the community now. So we're close to the end of our time I just wanted to follow up with uh, we opened with a with a really interesting thought-provoking like ac action um, Roy, Roy when you mentioned the two chairs on stage um, if that was something that uh, like a non-Indigenous artist wanted to incorporate in their performance, having two chairs on stage for missing children, 
would that be collaborative or would that be appropriation? Um, um, so I guess the, the line could be fine between that. And I mean, I'm getting into, I'm not an expert on appropriation, nor am I yeah, a, yeah. a police. Um, so if you're watching, feel free to disagree. But, um, you know, it's oftentimes about what I've learned is intention, authenticity, um, knowing why you're doing the things that you're doing, and then being really like sincere about it. Um, to put it bluntly, you would never, ever, ever even consider doing that if you thought it would make you look good, right? If you're like, oh, I want to be this reconciliation ally, so I'm going to put these chairs on stage. If that thought is in your mind, don't even think about it, honestly. If you're doing it because you are sincere and committed to honoring those children and doing absolutely everything in your power to make sure that the world changes so that there's no child like that ever again in the future and that you are expressing your profound love for those children and their and their rightful place amongst us and sort of acknowledging everything around us which is sort of you know to make a long story short some of the deeper ceremonial thoughts behind that then um it might be appropriate but don't play with it right like you're don't do it because you think it's going to make you look like an ally don't do it because you heard somebody else doing it do it because you know that it's the right thing to do and that you believe in what you're doing and you know why you're doing those things and uh yeah no that's that's great advice and uh like you said i think the there's multiple perspectives on everything and uh but i really appreciate what you had to say because uh mm -hmm. it is a very powerful statement and a very powerful action and i think it yeah it shouldn't be it shouldn't be performative. It should, it should it's, definitely, like you no, said, it's, yeah. it's not even in the realm of performative. You know, yeah. it's so much more fundamental than that. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I think uh, this concludes our time. I'd like to thank you both for participating and and lending your wisdom and your ideas and your experience to the conversation. I think, uh, like I said, for me, it's about making Canada a safer place, and I've learned a lot from you both on. Mm -hmm and your perspectives on what reconciliation means. So again, thank you for everything. Thank you for having me.